Sewing Stories, Harriet Power's Journey from Slave to Artist by Barbara Herkert, illustrated by Vanessa Brantley Newton, published by Alfred A. Knopf. See that sweet baby girl lying on a quilt her mama made? What could she be dreaming of? On a plantation near Athens, Georgia, Harriet's mama worked from rise to set while Harriet slept between the cotton rows. Harriet Angeline Powers was born into slavery on October 29, 1837, according to Clark County records. She was one of 5,000 African Americans in bondage in that county alone. Harriet grew up watching women carding cotton, spinning thread, dyeing and weaving cloth. She learned that wild indigo made blue, hickory bark made brown, and cherry bark made deep red. She studied strong stained fingers. Her heart beat to the booming of the loom. Slave women were involved in making textiles for the plantation. After they spun cotton into thread, they dyed it with natural coloring and wove it into cloth on a loom. In the evening, the women gathered together and cut flower sacks and worn clothes into suns and moons and stars, lions, birds, and elephants for appliqued cloth legends of Mother Africa. Harriet listened to their voices hum throughout the quarters late into the night. Some slave women sewed all day for the slaveholder's family. Only at night could they create for themselves. Applique is a technique where cut designs are stitched onto background fabric. The master frowned on slaves staying up late to sew. Little Harriet placed cotton filling in the quilt. She held the pine knot light high. I won't nod off, no ma'am. She was part of a sacred tribe. By a crumbling fireplace in the middle of the night, Harriet learned to sew stories. Most slaves were forbidden to learn to read and write. They passed on stories verbally and recorded them in cloth. Women sang and sewed by candle or pine knot light in rough log cabins on a section of the plantation called the quarters. On Sundays and holidays, sometimes the master gave permission for a quilting bee the women lowered wooden frames from cabin rafters. Long-limbed Harriet crawled under those big frames and watched needles dart through cloth like silver dragonflies. She thought, someday I'm gonna sew a magic world. While the mistress of the plantation usually supervised the sewing, at a quilting bee, the slave women could be their own artists, making designs with strips of cloth. For a few daylight hours, they might have felt free. When the women finished sewing, making two or three quilts in just one day, folks gathered for peach pie and ginger cake, collard greens and barbecue. While they gobbled up the grub, Harriet traced quilted shapes with her finger. Her mama smiled. Child, I think it's time you had a needle of your own. Yes, ma'am. The men were not allowed at the gathering until the quilting was over. Then they were invited in for a big meal, followed by a lively dance party. The women raised chickens and grew extra food in small gardens. They cooked in big open fireplaces. Strong-limbed Harriet helped the women sew. Afterwards, she danced at the frolic. Horsehair fiddles, cheese box tambourines, and sheep bone drums form the band. If Armstead Powers could capture Harriet beneath a quilt, he could claim a hug and a kiss. Harriet slowed her pace just a little bit. Sure enough, Armstead caught her with a story. Young ladies gathered at the quilting bees as much to dance and flirt as to sew. They danced the turkey trot and the Mary Jane. Buckets, pans, and grass reeds were also used as musical instruments. Harriet and Armstead jumped the broom together when Harriet was just 18. Soon Harriet became a mama. She named her pretty baby Amanda. Pray we stay together and don't get sold away, she said. When Harriet and Armstead decided to marry in 1855,
they had to get permission from the slaveholder. Part of the ceremony was jumping over a broomstick. The Civil War began in 1861, a bloody war to end slavery. Harriet wrapped Amanda in a quilt she made and held her, hu held her tight as Civil War cannons fired. The army from the north marched into Athens. The Union soldiers told the slaves, you're free. Hallelujah, free at last, Harriet cried. But trouble didn't end with the war, oh no. Poverty raced through Georgia. How would Harriet feed her family? Amanda, Alonzo, Nancy, Lizzie, and baby Marshall. Five hungry faces, 10 bare feet. Show me the way, Harriet prayed. The Emancipation Proclamation declared the slaves free on New Year's Day, 1863, but it could not be enforced in areas still under rebellion. In Georgia, slaves were not freed until Union General Sherman's army invaded in 1864. Slaves in Athens were most likely emancipated sometime after the fall of Atlanta in September, 1864. In Athens, the aftermath of the war was worse than the war itself. Food, medicine, and clothing were scarce. Smallpox ravaged the town. Harriet took up her needle, turning snips of calico and an old pair of dungarees into cloth stories that warmed her children and lifted her from hard times for a while. You gotta take what you've been given and make something out of it, she said. In addition to making quilts, Harriet may have earned extra money by sewing clothes. Armstead earned very little as a farmhand. Harriet saved every extra nickel. The family bought a little farm, a horse, a plow, and some seed. Now plates of catfish steamed on the table, fat vegetables ripened on the vine. The children grew like the cotton Armstead planted. Cotton mills popped up all over Georgia and folks celebrated good times. Sometime in the 1880s, Harriet and Armstead bought four acres near Sandy Creek outside of Atlanta. The family fished and grew vegetables and profitable cotton. Cotton mills purchased cotton from local farmers like Armstead. Athens announced its own party, the Cotton Fair. Folks were abuzz about the craft exhibit. Who would win best in show? I reckon the good Lord gave me a skill, Harriet said. She snipped calico as pink as watermelon. She cut strips of cloth as green as key limes. Harriet sewed stories of Cain and Abel, Jacob and Jesus too. Familiar stories that formed pictures in her mind. She stitched Bible folks in scenes where polka-dotted camels, elephants, and ostriches lived together in a fabric land. Harriet had grown up hearing Bible stories from the chairbacker, a slave who proclaimed he'd been called to preach. She might have sat in the back at the slaveholder's church. She was fascinated by circus animals. The Northeast Georgia Fair of 1886, called the Cotton Fair, included a Wild West show, several weddings, and a circus. Folks entered the craft exhibit, competed for best in show, but Harriet was not reported as the winner. Folks at the cotton fair gathered around Harriet's quilt. A young woman, Jenny Smith, offered to buy it. How could Harriet part with a piece of her heart? No, ma'am, not for any price. Harriet hung her quilt in the corner of the exhibit tent next to seed displays, jars of pickles, and mounds of potatoes. Jenny Smith, an art teacher, recognized it as a rare work of art. Dark days came a knocking when the price of cotton fell. Harriet sent word, would Miss Smith still like the quilt? Oh yes, Harriet climbed into an ox cart 
and as Armstead drove her into town, she cradled that quilt like a child. Harriet told Miss Smith, You can have it for ten dollars. I only have five to give, Miss Smith replied. I reckon that'll do, owing to the hardness of the times. Then Harriet explained each story sewn within the squares, like the lyrics of a song spun onto cloth. She climbed back into that ox cart, and as Armstead drove away, her lap felt as empty as her heart. Miss Smith wrote down Harriet's descriptions of the 11 panels of her creation. It's my intention, Miss Smith wrote, to exhibit this quilt in the colored building at the Cotton States Exposition in Atlanta. Now folks were a-talking. Could Harriet make another story quilt? Oh, yes. She pieced together Bible stories and tales of real events in the sky. A meteor shower, bright lights burning in the night. It was snowing fire, Harriet said. On a day called Black Friday, the sky grew dark as midnight, and all the cows and roosters went to bed. Harriet delivered the quilt to some ladies in Atlanta, slipping their dollar bills into her apron pocket. Her heart was heavy, another beloved story sold away. Still, it pleased her to hear the women's praise. Some Atlanta University faculty wives saw the first quilt at the exposition and commissioned the second quilt as a gift for the vice president of the board. This time, Harriet mixed local tales and legends. She'd grown up hearing the meteor shower of 1833 and Black Friday of 1780 when a combination of smoke from forest fires, a thick fog, and cloud cover caused an unusual darkening of the sky. We don't know how much Harriet earned for the second quilt, but it attracted a lot of attention. 1902, Atlanta University held a conference called the Negro Artisan. Harriet's quilt may have inspired the event. Harriet never had much money. She didn't own much property. It was a struggle to get by. Her cloth stories lifted her to another world where suns and moons, animals and angels dance together across a fabric sky. One day shall I reach heaven, and one day shall I fly. Harriet Powers died of pneumonia on January 1st, 1910. Now everyone can see the world as she did, for her work hangs in two fine museums and is celebrated worldwide.